Swaraj and Swadeshi ran parallel on Gandhi's schedule. On July 31st, he inaugurated the campaign for the boycott of foreign cloth by kindling an immense bonfire in Bombay, not out of racial hatred, but as a sign of India's determination to break with the past. To Gandhi, the outward fire was a symbol of the inner fire, which would burn up all weaknesses of the head and the heart. In burning my foreign clothes, I burn my shame, said he. It would be wrong to give this material to the poor, for the poor too have a sense of honor. The bonfire spread all over the land. Gandhi went from village to village and from town to town. Here in Madurai, he decided to discard his cap and vest, realizing that the millions were too poor to replace the discarded foreign clothes. On the morning of September 21st, his head was shaved and he wrapped a piece of khadar around his loins. Thus he resolutely took to the loincloth. Great events seemed imminent. Gandhi declared, It is contrary to national dignity for any Indian to serve under a government which has brought about India's economic, moral and political degradation. Non-cooperation clashed with Poet Tagore's way of thinking. Steering his bark against the current, he addressed the nation. Though the Mahatma is the master of truth and love, it is possible that real freedom of the soul may be crushed in the name of outward liberty. In Gandhi's command of spin and weave, he did not see the gospel of a new creative age. For him, the awakening of India was bound up with the awakening of the world. The warning of the great sentinel evoked a firm rejoinder from Gandhi. When all about me are dying for want of food, the only occupation permissible to me is to feed the hungry, and hunger is drawing them to the spinning wheel. Our non-cooperation is with the material civilization and the exploitation of the weak. I want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any of them. The revolution seemed to be smouldering everywhere, ready to burst into flames when the Indian National Congress met at Ahmedabad in December 1921. The Congress again proclaimed its faith in civil disobedience as a weapon equally effective and more human than armed rebellion and delegated its powers to Gandhi as its sole executive authority. Gandhi informed the Viceroy that Bardoli Taluka in Gujarat was to be the first unit of non-violent mass revolt. But on February 5, 1922, on the outbreak of violence at Chauri Chaura, in the district of Gorakhpur. Taking the sins of the people upon himself, Gandhi made a confession. God spoke clearly through Chauri Chaura. Mob violence, even in answer to grave provocation, is a bad augury. He suspended the intended mass civil disobedience in Bardoli and imposed on himself a five-day fast as a penance. The long expected happened at last. On March 10th, when Gandhi was about to retire, the police party arrived in the ashram to arrest him. Feeling happy and gratified at his arrest, he equipped himself with his barest necessities. The ashram inmates joined in his last prayer and bowed to him. Blessing them, Gandhi took their leave.
At noon, March 18th, the great trial began at Circuit House, Ahmedabad. When a frail, serene, indomitable figure entered, the entire court rose in an act of spontaneous homage. Gandhi was indicted on three seditious articles published in Young India. The first two contained the declaration of fight to the finish and preached disaffection towards the government. In the third, challenging the power-intoxicated British Empire, surviving on the exploitation of the weaker races, Gandhi had argued, how can there be any compromise whilst the British lion continues to shake his gory claws in our face? Accused Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, aged 53, describing himself as a farmer and weaver by profession, spoke in his own defense and pleaded guilty to the charge. I hold it to be a virtue to be disaffected towards a government which in its totality has done more harm to India than any other system. I do not ask for mercy. I am to invite and cheerfully submit to the highest penalty that can be inflicted upon me for what in law is a deliberate crime and what appears to me to be the highest duty of the citizen. The most epic event of modern times ended quickly. Gandhi was sentenced to six years simple imprisonment. The embodied symbol of the Indian nation disappeared as the gates closed behind him. Peace, non-violence, self-suffering was the message which vibrated from the prison walls. This was the prison meant for Gandhi's long rest. Gandhi saw that the prison system was almost devoid of humanity. He was kept in solitary confinement. The jail manual was applied to him rigorously. He was subjected to search daily before lockup. His resistance as a satyagrahi ceased and obedience was resumed as a prisoner though he respectfully declined to be humiliated. Gandhi mapped out a program of studies to finish which six years were not enough. He accounted for every minute of his time. His day dawned with a prayer. At six, he began his work. Spinning, which became an inner need with him, occupied him for three hours. While turning the spinning wheel, his attention was fixed on a single point. Believing that every spinner should learn to card, he engaged himself in carding for an hour. Six hours he devoted to literary efforts, sitting down to his books with the delight of a young man. He read extensively on religion and literature. He studied over again the Hindu scriptures and works on Islam, Christianity and Buddhism. He also read on social and natural sciences. History for him had a special spiritual significance, for he believed that truth transcends history. In prison, Gandhi was as happy as a bird.
Gandhi's spirit animated the free world. Romain Rolland observed in his biography of Gandhi, this is the man who stirred 300 million people to revolt, who has introduced into human politics the strongest religious impetus of the last 2,000 years. The walls were no barriers to his thought. He wrote a primer for children, which stressed the importance of a clean body and a composed mind, of prayer, spinning and nature study, hoping that the mother in India would in future be her child's teacher. Twenty-two months of the prison life had an adverse effect on Gandhi's health. On the night of January 12, 1924, amidst a violent thunderstorm, state prisoner Gandhi was operated upon in the Sassoon Hospital, Pune. The electric light fused during the operation. The appendectomy had to be finished by the light of a hurricane lamp. Gandhi thanked his surgeon Colonel Medoc profusely, and they became warm friends. The prisoner under guard began picking up unexpectedly fast. On February 4th, the government remitted the unexpired portion of Gandhi's sentence and released him unconditionally. His reaction was, my release has brought me no relief. Early in March, Gandhi came to Palm Ban at Juhu by the seaside near Bombay to recuperate. He enjoyed the beauty of the landscape and recovered slowly. While convalescing, Gandhi resumed editorial charge of his weeklies after two years. I had hoped for release by an act of a Swaraj parliament, he wrote, but that was not to be. We have yet to attain freedom. I have no new program. My faith in the old is just as bright as ever. It soon became obvious to Gandhi that the only question before the country was that of Hindu-Muslim unity which was both necessary and natural. The triumph of communalism over national interest weighed heavily on his body and mind. Dedicated to the highest cause, universal brotherhood of man, though still weak, Gandhi, at the call of his conscience, imposed upon himself a penitential fast of 21 days on September 18, 1924. The attention of the nation was focused on Maulana Muhammad Ali's house in Delhi, for the stake was one man's life and the price the nation's freedom. Gandhi appealed to end the quarrel, which was a disgrace to religion and humanity, Faith in oneself is faith in God. If we have that faith, we shall cease to fear one another. The 39th session of the Indian National Congress was held at Belgaum on December 26, 1924, with Gandhi as the president. He induced the Congress to accept the spinning franchise, making labor in the form of a contribution of self-spun yarn as an alternative to four-anna membership. His concluding remarks were, Satyagraha is search for truth. Like Swaraj, it is our birthright. Throughout 1925, Gandhi traveled ceaselessly to be morally prepared for future political opportunities. Fiery and passionate words flowed from him. Our ability to reach unity in diversity 
will be beauty and the test of our civilization. My Swaraj takes note of the weakest of the weak. It will come not by the acquisition of authority by a few, but by the acquisition by all of the capacity to resist authority when it is abused. Gandhi regarded untouchability as a fiendish sin. Anything that is prejudicial to the welfare of the nation is untouchable, but no human being can be so. The spinning wheel was presented to the nation for giving occupation to the millions who have been reduced to pauperism. Charkha is intended to realize the essential and living oneness of interest among India's myriads. It is criminal to displace the hand labor by the introduction of power-driven spindles. If India was really to prosper in her villages and not in her cities, the spinning wheel was the only instrument of its prosperity and freedom. At the news of the sudden death of Deshbandhu Chitaranjan Das, Gandhi almost broke down. India has lost a jewel, but must regain it by gaining Swaraj. On the expiry of his presidential term, Gandhi took a vow of a year's political silence and immobility, for he believed that silence was the language of cosmic adoration. The year of silence gave Gandhi's body time to rest. He devoted more time to the inmates of his ashram and kept in touch with the people through his journals, trying to awaken and strengthen the nation from within by advocating social reforms. Justifying his crucial decision to kill an ailing calf in the ashram, he argued, I felt that humanity demands that agony should be ended by ending life itself. After a calm and clear judgment, to kill or cause pain to a living being from a pure, selfless intent may be the purest form of ahimsa. To cause pain or wish ill to take life of any living being out of anger or selfish intent is himsa. He gave discourses on the New Testament, the Gita and the Ramayana. The central theme of the Gita, according to him, was the renunciation of the fruits of one's action. A new impulse was driving the people forward. The peasants of the Bardoli Taluka in Gujarat, who were lifted into a mood of sacrifice by the spark of Gandhism, launched a struggle against the oppressive increase of revenue under the guidance of Vallabhai Patel, spontaneously called Sardar, the leader. Hundreds were arrested and driven off their farms. Their property was attached and confiscated. Gandhi gave consolation. Those who have stout hearts and hands need never fear loss of belongings. They will have lost their positions but kept their honor. People driven by the nationalist spirit that was awakened in the country greeted the Simon Commission with black flags and angry shouts of go back. The Commission was touring India in connection with constitutional reforms. The repressive measures of the government failed to frighten the people. In an anti-Simon demonstration in Punjab, the veteran leader Lala Lajpat Rai was struck on the chest. He died soon afterwards. Gandhi's tribute was, men like Lalaji cannot die so long as the sun shines in the Indian sky. The Calcutta Congress was held in December 1928 under the presidentship of Motilal Nehru. A 
revolutionary spirit was aroused in the youth of the country. A controversy raged around dominion status and independence. Representing the younger generation, Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose opposed the All Parties report supporting Dominion status. Effecting a compromise, Gandhi moved a resolution that gave a year's grace to the government for granting Dominion status and warned, in the event of its non-acceptance by December 31st, 1929, the Congress will declare complete independence as its goal. Political tension was mounting. A rude awakening came on April 8th when Bhagat Singh and Batukeshwar Dutt dropped two bombs in the Central Assembly as a protest on behalf of those who had no other means left to give expression to their heart-rending agony. Deploring the incident, Gandhi appealed to the people to pursue non-violence with redoubled vigour. Gandhi's epoch-making autobiography, His Experiments with Truth till 1920, appeared in two volumes. My life from this point onwards, argued he, has been so public that there is hardly anything that the people do not know about it. Gandhi hailed the young president-elect of the Congress. Jawaharlal is pure as the crystal. He is truthful beyond suspicion. He has, by his bravery, determination, application, integrity and grit, captivated the imagination of the youth of the land. The nation is safe in his hands. The year of grace was coming to an end. The 45th session of the Indian National Congress met on the banks of the Ravi on the outskirts of Lahore. Motilal Nehru handed over charge of the Congress presidentship to Jawaharlal, son followed father, and declared himself a socialist and a republican. Independence for him meant complete freedom from British domination and British imperialism. The overflowing enthusiasm was for a symbol and an ideal. The atmosphere was surcharged with the gravity of the occasion. At the stroke of midnight on December 31st, 1929, as the old year yielded place to the new, Gandhi's historic resolution on independence and the action to be taken was passed. The flag of Indian independence was unfurled amidst deafening shouts of Inkelab Zindabad, long live revolution. India's cry for independence resounded all over the world. To give a start to the campaign, January 26, 1930 was observed as Independence Day. The vast multitudes all over the country solemnly pledged, we believe that it is the inalienable right of the Indian people, as of any other people, to have freedom. We hold it to be a crime against man and God to submit any longer to a rule that has caused disaster to our country. The celebration gave the necessary impetus to Gandhi, convincing him that the time was ripe for action. He published an 11-point manifesto stressing that total prohibition, reduction of the land revenue and the military expenditure and the abolition of the salt tax were the vital needs of the people. Next to air and water, salt is perhaps the greatest necessity of life, wrote Gandhi. In a letter to the Viceroy, he announced his intention. If my letter makes no appeal to your heart, on the 11th day of this month, I shall proceed to disregard the provisions of the SALT law. 
As the independence movement is essentially for the poorest in the land, the beginning will be made with this evil. On receiving a no from the Viceroy, Gandhi exclaimed, On bended knees I asked for bread, and I received stone instead. Gandhi resolved that he would himself perform the first act of civil disobedience by taking salt illegally from the sea with select ashram inmates for whom non-violence was an article of faith. India was preparing to vindicate its right to freedom. On March 9, 1930, crowds and crowds of men, women and children forded the river Sabarmati. 75,000 people met and in Gandhi's presence took the pledge Without achieving freedom for our country, we shall not rest in peace, nor will the government get peace. Gandhi devoted all his time and energy to an intensive preparation of the ashram for the final conflict at the appointed hour. Everyone was on the tiptoe of expectation. On the eve of the historic salt march, Gandhi touched the tender chords of the people's hearts when he said, These may be the last words of my life on the sacred banks of the Sabarmati. We have resolved to utilize all our resources in the pursuit of an exclusively non-violent struggle. Women can stand shoulder to shoulder with men in this movement. Hoping that the stream of civil resistors would flow unbroken, he gave instruction, after I have broken the law wherever possible, civil disobedience of salt laws should be started by manufacturing, purchasing and selling contraband salt. May God keep off all obstacles from the path in the struggle that begins tomorrow. On March 12th, with the coming of daylight, India's soul was awake. More and more eager and throbbing crowds collected. Prayers having been sung, the pilgrim was ready to make the great beginning of the great movement. The long-awaited hour arrived, and he was there. The great march for liberty began. Gandhi started on his 241-mile-long trek from the ashram to Dandi a village on the sea coast, along with his chosen band of 78 ashram inmates, symbols of the national determination with a strong resolve and undaunted look. As the epic march began, multitudes thundered out their welcome to the revolution and expressed their will to do and die through the cries of Inkalab Zindabad. 61-year-old Gandhi, with his undying faith in the justice of the cause he was pursuing and in the success of the great campaign he had embarked upon, marched at the head of the procession with quick and unfaltering steps. The pilgrim marches onward on his long trek through the seas of humanity to the appointed place where India is first coming to grips with the great British Empire, observed Jawaharlal Nehru. Staff in hand, he goes along the dusty roads of Gujarat, clear-eyed and firm of step, with his faithful band trudging along behind him. Many a journey he has undertaken in the past, many a weary road traversed, but longer than any that have gone before is this last journey of his, and many are the obstacles in his way. 
but the fire of great resolve is in him and surpassing love of his countrymen. None that passes him can escape the spell, and men of common clay feel the spark of life. It is a long journey, for the goal is the independence of India and the ending of the exploitation of her millions. Soldiers of freedom marched all along the distance of 13 miles to Aslali, the first halt. The villagers gave a ceremonial reception to the Satyagrahis on the outskirts of the village. After the day's march through heat and dust, Gandhi and his followers entered the village Dharamshala for the night's rest. meeting was held in the village. And he explained his mission. The soldiers of the first batch had burnt their boats the moment the march began. He added that he would not return to the ashram until the SALT Act was repealed and Swaraj won. He expounded the real nature of democracy. We want to establish a government which will not do anything against the will of the people. He exhorted the villagers to take to the spinning wheel to look to the sanitation of the village and to treat the untouchables with brotherly love. He also urged them to join the movement to break the most inhuman poll tax as it would be a step forward on the way to Swaraj. Next morning, the people of Aslali saw Gandhi stride away with his pilgrim band to the next stage in the journey to the sea. Daily, Gandhi tramped about ten miles. On the way, he spoke on his familiar themes, beseeching the people to abjure alcohol, abandon child marriage, and, when the signal came, to break the salt law. As the procession marched through village after village, the people followed the fortunes of this marching column from day to day, and the temperature of the country went up. The army was marching in a disciplined manner. The agile general in front was indeed a source of inspiration to all. The march continued, and the message of sedition came in clearer and firmer tones. In ten days, the marchers covered 115 miles, half the distance between Sabarmati and Dandi. 
The pitch of the people's emotion was rising, and so was the readiness for sacrifice. On the 15th day, the band reached Broach and crossed the river Narmada. April came. Gandhi drew near to the sea and the country waited for the word to begin civil disobedience. Gandhi conducted his daily prayer meetings and spoke at all the halting places, seeking the people's cooperation for the righteous struggle. He observed. Satyagraha cannot succeed without a spirit of purity and self-sacrifice. The rebel preached the duty of disloyalty. Loyalty to a state so corrupt is a sin, disloyalty a virtue. In the area traversed, several village headmen threw up their government jobs. Gandhi admonished his hosts for being lavish and extravagant in welcoming the marchers. In your hospitality towards servants like us, you will have to be miserly rather than lavish. He was confident of enlisting the cooperation of the people. It was his feeling that women would contribute more to the struggle for Swaraj than men. Gandhi voiced his firm determination to win Swaraj. Either I shall return with what I want, or my dead body will float in the ocean. Monday was a day of rest every week. Gandhi insisted on the ashram routine being followed by every one of the pilgrims, especially in three essentials, prayer, spinning, and writing the daily diary. That rigorous self-discipline will generate in us, said he, a force which will enable us to retain what we have won. Truth was once again on the march. Never was the wave of patriotism so powerful in the hearts of Indians as it was on this great occasion. The eyes of the world were focused on Gandhi and on Dandi, a small village on the seashore in Gujarat, which was preparing to receive streams of men and women. Dandi, the destination of the great march, was in sight. After a 241 mile long trek, lasting for 24 days, the pilgrims reached the promised land on the morning of April 5th. Sarojini Naidu received Gandhi and his followers on the outskirts of the village. On reaching Dandi, Gandhi felt greatly relieved. God be thanked for what may be termed the happy ending of the first stage in this, for me at least, the final struggle for freedom. Gandhi arrived at his seaside resort for rest. After relaxing for a few hours, he set out to prepare the people for the war against the salt tax that was to begin next morning. Addressing the eager crowds gathered under the banyan tree, Gandhi reaffirmed his decision to break the salt law. God willing, I expect with my companions to commence actual civil disobedience tomorrow morning. 6th April has been to us, since its culmination in the Jallianwala massacre, a day for penance and purification. I am positive that the greater the purification, 
the speedier will be the glorious end for which the millions of Indians consciously or unconsciously are striving. He issued a warning. Those who fear the government will leave. Only those who are prepared for jail going and for receiving bullets should accompany me tomorrow morning. May God always be with us. On April 6th, the first day of the National Week, Gandhi's morning prayer was more than usually solemn. He gave final instructions for the struggle and nominated Abbas Tayyabji and after him Sarojini Naidu as his successors. Soon after, Gandhi, with his satyagrahis, proceeded for a bath in the sea before launching the struggle amidst deafening cries of Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. The leaders and his followers bathed in the sea. After the dip into the sea, walking at a slow pace, in solemnity, Gandhi picked up a lump of natural salt on the seashore and the nefarious monopoly was broken. This was the signal for which the nation had been long waiting. The act performed, India had its cue. It seemed as though a spring had been suddenly released all over the country. The agitation and disobedience spread to the far-flung regions. India was seething in revolt. It was open to anyone who would take the risk of prosecution under the salt law to manufacture salt wherever he wished and wherever it was convenient. The main thing was to commit a breach of the obnoxious law. The program impressed the multitude and made them act in an organized way. In town and villages, everywhere within reach of the sea, salt manufacture was the action of the day. Due to the abounding enthusiasm of the people, this program spread like a prairie fire. Most striking was the part of women in the national struggle. In the hour of trial, they came out in large numbers from the seclusion of their homes and threw themselves into the struggle. Gandhi observed, in this non-violent warfare, women's contribution should be much greater than men's. To call women the weaker sex is a libel. It is man's injustice to women. If non-violence is the law of our being, the future is with woman. Many curious expedients were adopted to produce salt. It was waved about in triumph and often auctioned for fancy prices. Nowhere had a law been more peacefully and yet more defiantly disobeyed. All honor to the people who were fighting this unequal battle with bravery and a firm determination to go through the brutalities and tortures perpetrated on them. There were numerous prosecutions, more numerous arrests, far more numerous detentions, forcible seizures of salt and brutal and savage assaults on the people. And yet, there was unbreakable peace everywhere and greater determination to prosecute the campaign. The war against the salt tax continued. On the 13th of April ended the most glorious of all the national weeks since 1919. Leaders were being removed from the midst of the people. On the arrest of Jawaharlal Nehru, the Congress president, Gandhi observed, 
It is an affront offered to the whole nation. The arch offender was kept free and his activities continued unabated. Day after day, he went to the surrounding villages and delivered the message of disobedience. This Indian empire was conceived in immorality. Let us therefore pray and work for the destruction of this demonstrably immoral system with the national creed of non-violence. Sisters should picket liquor shops, opium dens and foreign cloth shops. For who can make a more effective appeal to the heart than women? Foreign cloth undermines the economic foundations of the nation and throws millions out of employment. So, young and old in every home should play the takli and spin. Testing time seems to be coming faster than I had expected. We must accustom ourselves to standing unmoved in the face of cavalry or baton charges or bullets. Gandhi sounded a warning to the black regime. If the government neither arrest nor declare the salt free, they will find people marching to be shot rather than be tortured. He explained the difference between freedom and license. Freedom is a fruit of suffering. License imposes suffering upon society and labeled the government as a government of unbridled license. On the promulgation of the Ordinance of the Press Act, Gandhi advised the pressmen to be prepared for handing over their property along with their bodies to the authorities rather than sell their souls. In a mango grove at Karadi, a village near Dandi, Gandhi set up his camp. He sensed that the time had come for greater acts of rebellion. In a draft letter to the Viceroy, he announced his intention to raid the Dharasana salt depot. It would be cowardly on my part not to invite you to disclose to the full the leonine pause of authority and to give the victims an opportunity for greater and greater suffering. Success is the certain result of suffering of the extremist character voluntarily undergone. Gandhi and his disciples had gone to sleep in the palm leaf hut at Karadi. At dead of night, on May 4th, a sudden tramping of feet was heard, disturbing the quiet repose of the camp. A party of armed constables entered Gandhi's shack to arrest him under Regulation 25 of 1827. His message to the nation was, India's self-respect is symbolized, as it were, in a handful of salt in the Satyagrahi's hand. Let the fist holding it, therefore, be broken, but let there be no voluntary surrender of the salt. I would like our people to make the highest sacrifice of gaining life by losing it. The state prisoner was taken to his old quarters in the Yaravada Central Jail and was detained without trial under the most arbitrary law. Men, women and children of all communities and classes in India joined together and proclaimed their determination to win liberty or to die. India waged a relentless struggle facing hardship cheerfully on the path of high purpose and noble endeavor. It was in this readiness to suffer that the moral power of this movement resided. Massive raids on salt pans and depots were organized. True soldiers of India, without care of fame or reward, labored unceasingly and peacefully. Civil disobedience everywhere was answered with firing and barbarous lati charges. Those struck down fell sprawling. Government measures became more and more intense and brutal. The non-violent Satyagrahis showed marvelous endurance and discipline. Thousands courted imprisonment and suffered all manner of privations. 
Here was India being governed forcibly under an absolute dictatorship. The bureaucracy were for more and more ruthless measures. Every kind of civil liberty was suppressed. With various repressive ordinances following each other in quick succession, grew the opportunities of breaking them. Presses were seized and news bulletins appeared in cyclostyle to break the law of sedition. The boycott of foreign cloth and picketing of liquor shops was intensified. The peasantry were in fine metal and the no-tax campaign was started. The events had given the people confidence in their national strength and stamina. India was in full revolt. Scores of members resigned from the legislature. The Congress committees were declared illegal. The police began mass arrests. The leadership of the campaign passed from one person to another in quick succession. India became a vast prison house and yet the government failed to bend the people. Hundreds laid down their lives at the altar of freedom. It was a grueling battle and it went on for months. With the Viceroy's consent, Tej Bahadur Sapru and M. R. Jayakar went to Gandhi in the Yaravada prison for peace parleys. On Gandhi saying that the Congress president Jawaharlal Nehru's must be the final voice, the Nehru's, Motilal and Jawaharlal were brought to Yaravada from the Naini prison to confer with him. After discussion with the negotiators, the Congress leaders declared that an unbridgeable gulf separated them from the British position. They maintained that the wonderful mass response to the movement was its own justification and laid down the minimum conditions for its withdrawal. The document stressed the right of India to secede from the empire. On his unconditional release on January 26, 1931, the anniversary of Independence Day, Gandhi remarked, I am hankering after peace if it can be had with honor, and hurried to Allahabad, the home of Motilal Nehru, who was mortally ill. Motilal Nehru passed away on February 6th. With mingled pride and grief, Gandhi paid his tribute. The pyre is being dedicated at the altar of the nation. A crucial meeting of the Congress Working Committee held at Anand Bhavan, Allahabad, expressed its abiding faith in civil disobedience and passed Gandhi's resolution laying down conditions for a truce, demanding general political amnesty and immediate cessation of repression. Always willing to go out of his way to meet the opponents and seeking to break the barriers of anger and distrust, Gandhi decided to leave no stone unturned to attain peace and undertook to negotiate with the Viceroy. He came to Delhi for an interview with Lord Irwin and stayed at Dr. Ansari's house. On February 17th, the half-naked Fakir, as Winston Churchill called Gandhi, went to the Viceroy's house to parley with the representative of the King Emperor. As the talks progressed, Gandhi soon summoned the members of the Congress Working Committee for consultation. On his return from the Viceroy's house, he used to explain every point that arose in the discussion to the members of the working committee, 
which was constantly in session. Gandhi was fully occupied. He met many people and talked on different matters. He appealed to the sense of service in women and asked them to join him and share his aspiration of making the spirit of service permeate the atmosphere by becoming humble servants of the country. While the Gandhi-Irwin talks were suspended for a few days, Gandhi addressed a huge gathering in the Queen's garden. I may say this much, that these talks have been conducted in a most friendly manner and with much sweetness. What will be the result, I cannot say. The result is in the hands of God. It is His will that will prevail. The people's duty is to continue to do what India expects of them. After eight meetings, spread over three weeks, the Gandhi-Irwin Pact was signed on March 5, 1931. The settlement was provisional and conditional. The vital question of the objective of independence remained. It is not wise to say which is the victorious party, remarked Gandhi. The prison gates opened. Thousands of civil disobedience prisoners were discharged and welcomed by the people. On Gandhi's first entry into the city of Ahmedabad, after the historic march to Dandi 12 months ago, people were drawn to him as towards a magnet. They waited for hours on the river sands to hear one who was the quintessence of their conscious and subconscious will. Replying to the citizens' address, Gandhi justified the provisional settlement and asked the people to respect it in letter and spirit. For though it did not give Swaraj, it opened the second door to it. He advised the people to achieve communal unity, eradicate the drink evil, banish foreign cloth and produce khadar, which would not only help them in increasing their power, but also in securing complete independence. For the children, his message was, the history of the world speaks loudly about the actions of children. So I expect much from you in the struggle ahead. At the volunteers rally in Bombay, Jawaharlal Nehru, the Congress president, after paying a tribute to the brave comrades, reaffirmed, it is truce, not east. The Congress stands by the independence resolution. Jawaharlal Nehru characterized Gandhi as the father and apostle of the Indian Revolution. The Congress president said, by the sheer force of his personality and intense patriotism, he has always commanded our obedience. In the third week of March, Gandhi and his colleagues were given a reception the like of which Bombay had seldom witnessed. Jawaharlal Nehru exhorted the citizens to keep up the spirit of the independence pledge and assured them our ideal is unchanged. Gandhi stressed the importance of compromise. A new age has now begun. For full 12 months, we have developed a war mentality. Now we have to sing a completely different tune. The Satyagrahi, while he is ready to fight, must be equally eager for peace. The essential condition of compromise is that there should be nothing humiliating and nothing panicky about it. 
he declared that he did not conceive of any Swaraj in which the workers and the peasants had no hand in the administration of the state. Congratulating the workers at a Khadi center, Gandhi stressed the importance of constructive work as a preparation for Swaraj. Gandhi held the Congress volunteers and their work in esteem and asked them to be prepared both for peace and war and said that he would not accept any scheme of Swaraj which did not contain the substance of independence. Let us carry on the process of self-purification with greater faith so that we may grow in strength day by day. Despite Gandhi's desperate pleading, Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and Sukhdev were executed on the eve of the Karachi Congress. Gandhi felt that the execution of the three patriots had increased the nation's power to win freedom. The Karachi Congress, convened under the shadow of Bhagat Singh's execution, truly represented the temper of the country at the moment. As Gandhi arrived, the demonstrators greeted him with black flags and shouts of down with Gandhism and long live Bhagat Singh. Gandhi received them sweetly and smilingly accepted the black flowers and their indignation completely subsided. The Congress had a strong contingent of Khudai Khitmatgars, servants of God. They had played a conspicuous part in the civil disobedience movement in the frontier province under the leadership of Abdul Ghaffar Khan, called Frontier Gandhi. The annual session of the Congress met under the presidentship of Sardar Vallabhai Patel on March 29, 1931. The Congress represents and exists for the millions was the refrain of the President's address. At the Congress, the awakened spirit of the people was very much in evidence. It adopted a charter of fundamental rights embodying Gandhi's 11 points and a few more introduced by Jawaharlal Nehru, enumerating civic liberties, universal adult suffrage, free and compulsory education, and nationalization of key industries and stress the secular character of the state. Thus, the Congress took a step in the socialist direction to lessen the burden of the poor. The Congress session marked the pinnacle of Gandhi's popularity and prestige with the people. The Congress ratified the Gandhi-Irwin Agreement and appointed Gandhi as the sole Congress representative at the Round Table Conference. Gandhi said that his death could not kill Gandhism, which was the cult of non-violence and love, and appealed to young men to come out and embrace his creed. Gandhi was confident that God's covenant, that those who tread on the straight and narrow path shall never come to grief, would inspire the people with faith and hope, and that the poor man Swaraj would soon come through the chosen path of truth and non-violence. Purn Swaraj is not a pious wish today. It is the incessant yearning of the soul of the nation. I aspire for Ramaraj, or government of peace and love. This is my only dream. The Karachi Congress gave Gandhi an unrestricted mandate and invested him with full authority to speak and act in the name of the country. Gandhi had awakened the nation from the slumber of centuries and endowed it with the courage and determination to be free. The colors of the national flag were changed at Gandhi's instance. White, green and red were replaced by saffron standing for courage and sacrifice, white for truth and peace, green for faith and strength. The spinning wheel represented the hope of the masses. For Gandhi, 
true defense of the flag consisted in assimilating the qualities represented by the colors and in giving the spinning wheel a place in every home. He explained, we have nearly 700,000 villages, a large number of which are living in a condition of semi-starvation. And they do so because they have no employment for nearly six months in the year. That being the case, it is necessary to find some supplementary occupation. Such an occupation is hand spinning. 